Welcome back to Trading Matters, a podcast by OCBC Securities. In this show, we're focused on hunting down interesting market movements to help you become more opportunistic with your capital. I'm your host, Reggie, aka your Chief Financial Coconut. And this week, very interesting news cycle. Pelosi decides to land in Taiwan, sparking market sell-off, all these tensions and what have you, right? But it's not all bad news. Some of these companies are, in fact, maybe benefiting from all these tensions. So we're going to talk about two of them, Hong Kong Exchange, HKEX, and SMIC. Both of them may be able to benefit from this heightened tension to this period of uncertainty. So welcome back. Okay, CK, this week, a lot of things are... <laughs> A lot of things going on. But I mean, Pelosi is in town. So so what's the situation like? What, what's happening with the market and and all of that? But by the time our listeners hear it, will be next week already. Like. But the general idea is, you know, the, this very, very high level official has entered town and, and it has shook the markets a little bit. So what's happening? Yeah. So I mean, she didn't just enter town. She has yeah. left town as well. <laughs> she came and go already. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The big news. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's everywhere. Not just financial news, but like mm. literally everywhere. Everywhere. Right? Everywhere. Yeah. So the whole news about Nancy Pelosi, the US uh, House Speaker, actually, um, you know, flying into Asia, visiting Singapore, visiting Malaysia. And the big news is that she also visited Taiwan, right? Yes. Yeah. The big news is not just about her visit, but also the significance of it. And um, it coming at such a time of US-China tensions, you know, what uh, that has in terms of its impact. So we're not going to be going so much into the politics of it, but mm-hmm. we are really going to be looking at Financial impact, you know, yeah. what do the markets think? What there's a serious sell down. Yeah, there's serious sell down by the for the Chinese companies specifically. Yes, uh, and, and I wonder why. Like, why are people selling down the Chinese companies? Can can, can you give us some insights into into that front? Share with us why are Chinese companies being sold down? Well, the interesting thing is, you know, you can see this kind of divergence between the Chinese market. So you have Hong Kong Hang Seng Index, you have the CSI 300 at the mainland China markets, and the S&P 500, which is like the US market. Uh, and the impact this sort of geopolitical event has on these two markets is very different. So in the Chinese markets, you're right, you know, we did see some sell down, especially in the days approaching to when Pelosi yeah. landed in Taiwan. Uh, on the day itself, when you know she actually landed in Taiwan, and after that, when she left, some kind of relief rebound, you could say. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a huge sell down because I mean, I guess everyone is a little bit more wary when it comes to mm. risk. You know, there's this chance that might not be high, but there is still a chance that this entire situation escalate as a result of these tensions and, and all that would come with the escalation would be more uncertainty, more volatility, uh, potentially an impact to the Chinese stock market. So that could help to explain why it's sold down. In the US, on the other hand, a little bit of a sell down, but doesn't seem like there's a lot of uh, interest in the markets. And, and this entire event eventually blew over in the US very, very quickly. And we saw a huge rally in the S&P 500, driven primarily by earnings rather than this event which dominated the news headlines. Yeah. So is this a non-event? I think that's the question. <laughs> you know, like, you know, traders, investors, are always so much news, right? I mean, there's so many news channels that are just focused on these things. But is this actually something that we should care about? Well, I suppose... If you look at how the markets have reacted for some clues on, you know, the impact potentially, uh, then we can see that, you know, when Pelosi actually landed and there was a bit more uncertainty, markets in China and in Asia actually went down. Uh, Subsequently, you know, the biggest kind of uh, fears of the market of an escalation directly with Nancy Pelosi or with the US, that was kind of taken off the table when she left Taiwan and the markets actually had a bit of relief rally, like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So um, that was kind of the mood of the market over the past few days. And I suppose you could think of it as, you know, there's always this fear of escalation. Right, yeah. The current situation might be something that markets are still able to digest. But if there is something that comes uh, in, in the way of escalation, then that is a risk that you know certainly have investors a little bit more fearful. So the escalation is something that the markets are trying to understand. You know, This entire thing is not over yet. Pelosi might have left. But at the same time, you know, China is now furious. <laughs> China is furious about mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they have already gone out before her visit to actually say, you know, 
those who play a fire don't will come. get burned. Yeah. Don't come. And and she did anyway. And so now what's their response going to be like uh, in terms of military action or drills or, mm. or potentially any of these outcomes, economic uh, as well, are now currently directed to the island of Taiwan. So uh, the, the sanctions that they have on, on areas like sand, on areas like fish, seafood, or, or, or fruit, uh, right now are targeted mainly at Taiwan, but everyone's afraid of, you know, what would that mean for more systemically important to the global supply chain? Yeah. Uh, areas like semiconductors or uh, even in terms of, you know, what sanctions extend beyond Taiwan to potentially the US as well. Yes, and, and I think that's the part, right? If it stays within the region and the impact is kind of held there, then it doesn't really affect a lot of us, you know, there are more you know, a bit more global in our investment outlook, right? But do you foresee this as a precursor for even more things like more sanctions, you know, US, China directly? You know? I suppose if you look at it like how it is right now, it does seem to be quite localized in like, you know, China is having military drills around the island of Taiwan. Uh, and how that has impact on the global supply chain, as of right now, it just seems to be a few days of disruptions, maybe as ships get redirected or air traffic gets redirected. Uh, but at the same time, like I mentioned, you know, Taiwan actually, one of the very important aspects of the Taiwanese economy is actually this whole idea about its importance to the supply chain when it comes to especially semiconductors. Yeah. And the world's largest chip maker, TSMC, right, Taiwan Semiconductor, that is a Taiwanese company which has huge operations when it comes to Taiwan and semiconductors. Yes, yeah. Yes. So any disruptions in the area definitely would have an outsized impact as compared to what is currently being declared by China on Taiwan. There are a few companies that I think you wanted to bring out specifically to this situation that may actually be a bit beneficial for them. Like It's not just all bad news for everybody, right? So, so what mm. is one of these companies that we, we want to start with? Well, one of the companies that we actually want to cover today, right? Uh, we have covered it before and that's actually Hong Kong Exchange. So, you know, previously when we talked about Hong Kong Exchange, we actually said it could be a beneficiary from some of the volatility hitting global markets. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, volatility, if this is something that would remain in the Asian markets, in the Hong Kong market, then this could be once again uh, hit by, you know, potentially more volatility and more trading that comes with it. But the other angle that we actually want to highlight today when it comes to Hong Kong exchange is the angle of US-China tensions. And you know, this is not something that's new. You're right, it's been around since the time of Trump. Do we see any escalation in the area and how that could hit Hong Kong exchange? So the big news actually, it's not directly related to Taiwan and this Taiwan Strait kind of event, uh, but it's actually all about the US, Alibaba. exactly. Yeah. So the tech stocks, the Chinese tech stocks that are listed in the US and, and chief among them, of course, Alibaba, which came up with the news of Alibaba wanting to change its listing in Hong Kong from a secondary listing to a primary listing. Yeah, and, and it's, it's very important, right? I think for a lot of our listeners that don't understand, if a very big mega cap, right, you can say that they're mega cap, right? Very big yeah. mega cap comp <laughs> a big mega cap company lists in your exchange, that means all the transaction volume about this mega cap, you know, you, you, you actually siphon value out of it, right? Relative to being in the US. So any interesting development then for, for the Hong Kong exchange, you know, as a, as a trader? Because fundamentals tell me that oh, this, when more big companies made more big Chinese companies, company list in the Hong Kong market is great for the exchange itself. Yeah. So actually for the case of Alibaba, you could say that, uh, you know, they first led one trend and that was actually in 2019 where they listed as a secondary listing in Hong Kong exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, and subsequently with COVID coming in, actually some of the other Chinese tech uh, firms and the most prominent ones would be NetEase and JD.com. They came over to list secondary or so in Hong Kong exchange. But what they are doing right now is actually converting their shares in Hong Kong. Uh, they are converting their listing to a primary listing. And the significance of that is actually a little bit more technical, but it's something that traders look out for, uh, which is that that actually opens up themselves to be potentially included in this scheme called a Stock Connect. And the Stock Connect actually opens up the potential flows of money and flows of funds from mainland China into this stock, which is listed in Hong Kong. So you're talking about inflows on the scale of some analysts say about 16 billion to 21 billion US dollars. And that is huge, of course. Uh, even for a mega cap, that is significant when you talk about the, in terms of the amount of uh, money fund flows as well. So, so that is the significance of actually changing their listing just in terms of secondary to primary. And again, will that be something that sparks off a broader trend of, you know, will JD.com follow? 
with NetEase follow, but some of the other you know companies that are currently listed in the US actually going uh, follow in in Alibaba's footsteps. And, and along with the trading volume, of course, would be Hong Kong Exchange right at the heart of it as well. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, okay. So because of this stock connect policy, it now allows mainstream money to then flow into some of these bigger companies in a more direct fashion. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, Hong Kong Exchange, something to look out for. And there's another company, right? Right in the head of this whole Taiwan situation. <laughs> for all of you that didn't know, Taiwan is huge for semiconductors, right? TSMC. And today we want to talk a little bit about you can can you say they are competitors? This other company? Yeah, yeah, you can. Okay, you can. okay. So what, what is this company? So this company is actually SMIC or Semiconductor Manufacturing. Uh, it is actually the largest foundry in mm-hmm. China. So TSMC is the largest foundry in the world. It's based in Taiwan. Uh, SMIC is actually largest in China itself. But relative to the size of TSMC, when you talk about the operations, then it is still a smaller player. Mm-hmm. So the, the significance of SMIC is because it's a homegrown Chinese company, you could say. Mm-hmm. You know, So China actually as manufacturing hub of the world, uh, you have a lot of exposure to semiconductors and you need to import these semiconductors. So you notice, for example, during this current US, China and Taiwan situation, semiconductors are actually not part of some of the sanctions that China has imposed on Taiwan. So as a result of you know, some of these tensions, uh, there has been news out there that actually says you know, some of the analysts are now bracing themselves for a surge in the share prices and also some of the tailwinds for Chinese chip makers because, you know, mm-hmm. China is actually in this process of also decoupling and, and shifting a lot of its focus to its homegrown companies as well. And SMIC is definitely going to be one of the companies under its radar because they are simply the largest foundry that China has as of right now. Interesting. But can, can we also be clear that from a production capability standpoint, SMIC is still very far away from TSMC, right? Because Definitely, TSMC yes. produced one of the smallest, most fine, you know, finest, say three nanometer foundry. And no one else really does it, you know, other than... So know, TSMC so. is an industry leader right now, yes, you know. Yes. Uh, and they produce the smallest, they have the largest scale. Uh, I think closest to them is actually South Korea's South Samsung. Korea, yes. Samsung. Yeah. So SMIC is not there yet. They are producing chips at a larger scale right now. It sounds, you know, not much difference between like 14 nanometer, 3 nanometer. It's a world difference. But it's a yes. huge difference. And mm. I mean, the technology behind it, right? You know, that actually came out in the press a while back where, you know, you have this Dutch manufacturer, ASML. Uh, they are the ones that produce the most uh, sophisticated chip making equipment that TSMC uses right now. And the US came out to say, you know, can you pressure, like, the, they, they came out to pressure the, the Dutch government to, you know, not sell or push ASML not to sell this equipment to SMIC. Wow. So it's strategic for a lot of people. It's strategic for Taiwan. It's strategic for the US. It's strategic for China as well. And, and even though they don't have this latest technology right now, SMIC is also trying to push different areas of chip making and trying to make their own chips more sophisticated even without this existing equipment as well. Interesting. So essentially what I'm hearing is because of all these tensions, maybe the government will step in to try to prop up some of these uh, homegrown companies so that they become more resilient in the supply chain. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? So you're expecting more flows into some of these companies? Actually, if you think about it, this is not something that's new, right? So yeah. actually, the Chinese government has already come out to say, you know, this is an industry that is strategic. The US government is also in the process of, you know, passing the CHIPS Act and, yeah. and having some of these manufacturing capabilities not just based in Taiwan, but also based in the US soil. Yeah. So um, this is an area definitely that has developments related to the US-China tensions and will continue to be strategic because it's so important for these governments as of right now, what they are announcing in terms of policy support. And so that definitely means that, you know, if there's any shift in the tensions, if there's any uh, escalation in the tensions, then this could be an area definitely to watch. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Even the US did some sort of uh, technology swap with the South Koreans, <laughs> right? Giving them the vaccine production capabilities and wanting them to bring in all these kind of foundry capabilities. Very interesting development to come in the chip making space. So yeah, any uh, last things for us in, in this space of uh, China tensions with the US, and you know, again? Ongoing for sure. Yeah. But I think uh, if I could leave you with something, uh, that's really how all of the tensions 
I mean, it looks bad for the broader market, at least in Asia, and it did have an impact negatively. Uh, but there are pockets or sectors that have still benefited as a result of these tensions. And chip making is one area. Uh, we didn't have time today, but actually, if you look at some of the Chinese listed defense stocks, then that also rallied as a result of these escalating tensions. And we talked about that during the Russia-Ukraine crisis mm. earlier this year and how companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, they actually mm. had a positive boost to their share prices. So positioning yourself for possibilities and, and events, this is something that traders do. And actually, you see that happening even right now, even in the midst of a geopolitical crisis that, you know, there are traders that are positioning themselves for data that comes in when it comes to sanctions, when it comes to the economic realities on the ground as well. Interesting. Yeah, and I'm sure we will eventually talk about some of these defense companies <laughs> because uh, these are interesting things that sometimes we don't think about. Right. So yeah, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your time, CK. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Hey, thank you for tuning in weekly with us at Trading Matters, a podcast by OCBC Securities. If you want to be even faster in following latest market insights done by the team at OCBC Securities, you should visit iocbc.com slash trading matters for market insights on Singapore, China, Hong Kong, and the US, and a lot of the stuff that we couldn't cover on the show today. This show is jointly produced by the team at The Financial Coconut and OCBC Securities. We hope you become a more astute trader following our weekly show. And we want to hear from you. Join our ecosystem, events, and all that stuff. Details in the description below. I will see you next week.